welcome everybody to the first um, of our Art Speaks Lunchtime Zoom um, artist discussions. Uh, I'm Tracy Crum. I'm the Director for Artistic Advancement at Textile Center. Um, welcome again. This is our first uh, Zoom panel discussion that we are doing that is, uh, involves the artists who are participating in the exhibitions at Textile Center. Um, just so everybody knows, um, the exhibitions are up and live and we're taking uh, reservations for six visitors per hour. It's not extensive, but it's uh, bringing people back in the door. Um, and I just have to say that I'm totally thrilled that Pride is our opening um, exhibition really for the, in the Joan Mondale Gallery for the reopening of Textile Center to the public um, during the pandemic and um, all the action that's been happening in the Twin Cities over the last several months. So um, this has been a long, I feel like it's been a long time in the making. I have to say, frankly, I can't even remember how long it's been. Um, I think we probably started about a year ago and I wanna just give a shout out to Erica Diamond uh, and Michael Raddick. Um, Erica can't be with us today, um, but um, we have three of the artists uh, who are in the exhibition that are joining in the conversation. Um, Erica and Michael um, helped me out, I would say, a year ago, um, kind of look through and vet uh, the artists that we thought would make a really great collection of um, folks to participate in Textile Center's um, first show to publicly honor the LGBTQ uh, plus community. So, um, I'm so thrilled to be able to have curated this exhibition. It's been an honor and the artists have been so patient because we waited through the pandemic and their work all sat here under wraps at Textile Center and Ray Cordes, who will be moderating and I were finally able to install the work uh, several weeks ago when Textile Center reopened. So, um, boy we really appreciate the patience of the artists and the efforts that everybody has made to bring this together so um i'm going to just quickly introduce the artists you're going to get to know them better um during the discussion um i'm going to ask that folks um use the chat room to um, make comments, share information, and ask questions during the session. I will be muted, but I will be managing the chat room, and then I will be calling through the information from the chat room to help facilitate some question and answer uh, uh, as needed, as time permits and towards the end of the session. So um, for those of you, if you have any questions about how to use um, Zoom, hopefully you can all find the chat room along your bottom um, menus and go ahead and use that and I'll do my best to help you. Okay, so without any further ado, I'm going to welcome Bren a Ahern. Did I pronounce it right, Bren? Or, um, I say Ahern, but either way it's cool. Ahern. Bren uh, is hailing from, um, is it Palm Springs? Palm Desert. Uh, Palm Springs. Palm Springs, California. I'm sorry, I don't even have my notes with me in, in the office that I'm sitting in, but um, Bren is here joining us today, uh, Trey Gehring from Ohio. And Trey, are you still at Kent State teaching at Kent State or involved yeah. in Kent State? Yeah, I, I do teach part-time at Kent State. Okay, so Trey is with us from Ohio. And then um, Kira Keck, and are you, is Kira also from Ohio? And I'm so sorry that I... Yeah, I'm currently go. based in Columbus, Ohio. In Columbus, okay, so we have... We have Midwest representation today and West Coast. And I just want folks to know that we are doing these um, conversations every Thursday from noon to one, uh, for, at least through the end of the summer and actually into the fall when we bring on our We Are the Story uh, exhibitions um, in honor of Black Lives Matter. So um, please just keep an eye on your textiles on the town. Uh, newsletter to join in on these conversations um, or you can all of you I think got to the conversation by emailing me you are always welcome to email me and I will share the zoom link to the next panels so next week we'll be featuring artists from our art club network exhibition and then I think and Ray correct me if I'm wrong but it's August 20th that we are bringing back this the pride exhibition to talk with the remaining artists in the show is 
Is that can is that correct? Okay. I have so to check my notes to double check on that. Yeah. But, yeah. We'll let everybody know by the end of the session. So with that said, thank you so much uh, for joining us again. I'm going to mute myself and I'm going to let Ray Cordes take it over and have a conversation with the artist. Beautiful. Thank you, Tracy. Yes, thank you all for coming here today. Uh, this is going to be a very relaxed, just get to know the artist sort of session, right? So like Tracy said, if you have any questions, please refer them to the chat. We'll try to find the time or we will find the time to answer those questions at some point during this chat. A quick reminder that if you do want to stay on video, feel free. But if you do not want to be on video, that's totally fine as well. Um, yeah, I just wanted to start it off by going to each artist and kind of giving everyone the opportunity to give a short bio of like who you are, what art you what art you make. Um, I know that's a loaded question because there's so many different things that everyone works on. Um, but yeah, uh, let's start with uh, Bren. Introduce yourself. Oh. Hi everyone, um, my name is Bren Ahern and thanks Ray and Tracy and the folks at the center for having our show. I know for me, it's sometimes difficult for me to show my work, um, either because of the content or I'm not sure what reason. Um, but I'm just really grateful to the center for giving us this opportunity. And I see a bunch of the artists in the show in the audience. So hi everyone, great to see you all. Um, so I work primarily in embroidery and um, embroidery throughout the centuries has had different connotations, different meanings um, to different populations in different parts of the world. And I focus on the use of embroidery as an educational tool. So um, in particular, I work with the sampler form. So um, Tracy, is it possible to pull up my um, piece? Um, while she's working on that, I'll, I'll continue. So um, with samplers, you might say, well, what's, what's he talking about? So as an educational tool, so samplers, Let's say maybe a couple hundred years ago, um, perhaps some girls might not have been allowed to go to school. So they might have learned the ABCs by actually stitching them onto cloth. And if the girl had to go into service for a family later, uh, the girl might bring out this example cloth or a sampler and um, use it as a model or as a guide as she monograms the linens for that family she's in service for. <clears throat> in other times, um, on samplers, the girl might have embroidered some sort of statement about how to be a proper girl, a proper woman, or a biblical statement. And this got me thinking about how I've been educated to be a man in American society. And um, with my piece in the show, um, I talk, the piece in the show uh, is, is a floral pattern with footballs and baseballs. And it's a, um, it shows my lunchbox for my first day of kindergarten. And the text associating the piece is, I guess the flower lunchbox was the wrong accessory choice. So with this piece, I'm reflecting actually on my first day of first grade. Before I started first grade, I went with my family to King's, which was the local department store. And my parents, to their credit, they allowed me to pick out this lunchbox that had these flowers on it, bright green. And I'm really grateful to them but when I went to school, I quickly learned that a boy should not have a flowered lunchbox. So, oh, here's the piece. I quickly learned that a boy should not have a flowered lunchbox. So, um, Arlie, what's her name? Hochschild, um, a sociologist at Berkeley, she talks about these magnified moments. She said they could be these moments of extreme joy or something goes extremely wrong, but they kind of stick in your brain. And so this stuck in my brain. I think the reason why it stuck in my brain because it was the first time I learned how to perform my gender from someone outside of my family. Um, I learned that boys do not have flowered lunch boxes. And so I um, decided to create a piece to document this. Thanks. That's great. Um, with the bit that I know about you, Bren, it seems that you have a very artistic family. I think you're one of your, your sisters, a graphic designer. And, and the centered uh, sort of topic I wanted to talk about was iconography and the use, the use of imagery. Um, did that take a play in your work with, um, especially using textiles and imagery, things like that? Yeah, um, and actually about my family, my sister Mary Kay is actually here in the audience. So hi Mary Kay, thanks oh, for coming today. Hi Mary. <laughs> Mary Kay, she's, a, um, she's this skilled um, sewer and she's worked on 
the collections of uh, designers for New York Fashion Week. She's done all sorts of things. So she's very talented. And my mother's a quilter. And my grandmother used to crochet things. So um, it's, I guess I come from a textile tradition. Um, but to get back to your question about iconography, so I guess you can see I use the stereotypically feminine floral with the stereotypically masculine footballs and baseballs. And um, I guess to tie in with what I was talking about, performance to gender, this idea that boys have to do sports, or that's how it was when I was coming up. And um, Dan Wogue, he wrote this book called Jocks, and this uh, person, Pat Griffin, she talks about how sports are the place where boys learn to take their place in patriarchal society. Um, she talks about how um, it's where boys learn to be sexist and homophobic. She says that, for example, you throw like a girl are insults that are hurled at people. Or you don't play football. What are you, a faggot? I think that's the quote from her book. Um, but it's not that cut and dried for everyone. For example, my friend Andy, he, um, he mentioned that his father tried to force him to play sports, but he didn't really want to. And then when he and his wife had a baby, I gave him a, uh, a baby blanket with this motif on it, and they loved it. So I guess with this work, I'm trying to break down the binary, get people to question the binary, um, but also to realize that the binary isn't really um, so the binary, I think, exists in some people's heads, but I don't think it exists in everyone. And um, in terms of the sampler as an icon, I guess it's kind of this icon of things quaint, things gone by the good old days, um, whatever that means. And then thinking to the lunchbox, I guess the lunchbox is kind of your own canvas for your own icon. What message are you trying to convey by what's on your lunchbox? Absolutely. That goes with a lot of things. For me, it's stickers on my laptop. You know, it's <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> for everyone, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. To, to that end, I wanted to go to go to Kira. Thanks for joining us. Um, I, I think the crossover in like talking about the labor intensive uh, nature of your work and your use of of stripes and patternation also goes along with iconography. That's why I want to bring you bring you on today. Um, would you be willing to share a bit about yourself and your work? Yeah. Um, so I make a lot of my my primary medium is weaving and embroidery. Um, very into labor intensive processes. A lot of abstract grid based work. I'm very into color and woven structure. I also have a deep interest in kind of 1970s counterculture as it relates to the fiber arts movement, feminist arts movement, um, and craft cultures around that. Um, and lately that's kind of been coalescing into a deep passion for stripes and plaids, which you can, stripes can kind of be this, this like symbol for otherness in various contexts, and plaid is such an identity marker. Um, for, sorry, I have a quick question. If, if you could uh, clarify the term otherness, and what you mean by that? Um, so just basically um, otherness would be like uh, an identity outside of kind of the the idea that um, white heterosexual cisgendered men are like a default, the default human. Mm -hmm. Gotcha, thank you. <laughs> yeah, so I've been focusing on plaids, especially in relation to lesbian identity. Um, especially because it seems like there's there's a definite trope of like lesbians wear flannel shirts and there's growing up there was like a lack of I think there was a lack of representation of queer women and queer femmes in my life but like the one thing I knew about lesbians was they wore flannel um, so I'm using that as the way of kind of um, exploring my identity and my community Great. And, uh, you know, talking about plaid, we're looking at your two pieces right here in the show, the, the usage of a flag as well, along with plaid. Um, can you talk about your choice of making a flag with the textile and like what that may mean and how it has um, provided context for your work? Yeah. So with that piece, I was um, very specifically looking at the history of the pride flag and um, there's kind of not a general consensus in the lesbian community about what pride, pride flag um, should represent the lesbian community. There's a couple different, um, the most common one right now, I think is just a variation on the lipstick lesbian flag. 
but like there's the Labras lesbian pride flag, which has been used in the past. Um, and I was researching about like Gilbert Baker's pride flag and how, um, you know, certain colors like hot pink and turquoise had to be omitted because of manufacturing difficulties. Um, and when I was looking at other people's kind of proposals for, for lesbian pride flags, one of the considerations was, um, you know, what would be easy to manufacture? And my response was that my pride is not mass manufactured. So I wanted to create kind of this incredibly complicated um, statement of personal labor around those feelings and I wanted to use revolutionary colors. So I chose lavender and red um, as, the, as the focal points. Absolutely. So the, uses, the usage of color, pattern, everything is strongly tied within this. Um, and that, when you're talking about that, were you speaking mostly to your piece proposal for lesbian pride flag and, and what about the other, the other piece? Uh, the plate pride plaid, um, started as like a, I wanted to, so there's like a kind of like, started with a desire to <laughs> basically use finishing techniques as a way to piece together sections. Um, so it's, um, it's using like ideas that exist on the, the margins as ways of joining was kind of what I was trying to think, at, um, think about and this was a plaid I designed myself and I wove it in sections and then twisted all this fringe together. And as I was constructing it, these like, it started to become more sculptural. And then I was like, oh, I made a vulva. Um, <laughs> haven't done that in a while, but it definitely comes out, especially in, I think like fiber art sometimes tends to get really vulvic or phallic at certain points. Absolutely. That's yeah. any art form, honestly. It's yeah. always on accident. Too. I shouldn't say always, but a lot of times it's an accident. <laughs> yeah. The accident, you know? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, I wanted to uh, jump over to Trey. Uh, so with your work, you, you along with uh, Bren are using more specific imagery. You're using, you typically use the male torso or traditionally male torso in your imagery. Um, can you tell us a bit about that? and? Uh, and why, why no heads? Why, why make them anonymous? Um, so yes, uh, I'm Trey Gehring. Uh, I, this, both of these pieces are from the same series. Uh, the one on the left, shredded, or hashtag shredded, uh, is a digitally knit piece on an industrial knitting machine. Uh, and then the one on the right, hashtag gratido. Sorry about the pronunciation. My Portuguese isn't great, um, is a jacquard woven on a hand, hand woven on a jacquard loom. Um, so all the imagery from this series, which was called Muscle Bound, is taken from Instagram. So there are thousands and thousands and thousands of images of bodybuilders uh, that are out there on Instagram. So I kind of wanted to, rather than making more of that imagery, wanted to appropriate the existing imagery and kind of take that like slice of real life and make a commentary on it. They are all, although I kept the composition relatively similar to the original composition, I did crop them all down. I did want to add some anonymity, but I also wanted to emphasize the fact that it wasn't really about their face um, as an individual marker of individuality, but it was really about their body. And it's a focus on the hypermasculine body uh, as traditionally defined. But further than that, it's about a, the idea of once you push the masculine body to a certain point, at what point does it start to become decorative and therefore start to have feminine connotations? Because the ideas of excess um, and superficiality that are often connected with textiles in the domestic sense when we think about lace or home furnishings 
and kind of more and more as we live in a plastic dominated world, I think that textiles are becoming more and more seen as kind of something delicate, something domestic. It's kind of furthering that earlier connotation of textiles. Um, and then the work is also about the idea of proposing the theory that perhaps these men are kind of engaging in a form of self-objectification in a way to kind of get around certain hegemonic patriarchal rules. Um, if you look at the comments back and forth between these inv individuals, they kind of form their own groups. And generally it's these men fascinated with bodybuilding that are bodybuilders that are following each other and then making comments about each other's progress and kind of making these comments. And it creates this very homoerotic environment, but it's okay because it's within the context of this hyper-masculine body. Uh, so I thought that was really interesting that once the body becomes an object, then you can kind of break the rules about what sort of intimacy you can have as a heterosexual man with another heterosexual man. Absolutely, and it's interesting with it being over social media too, because again, it's, it's relationships, but it's technological and still separate, you know, and also with using, in using textiles to create it, it's a very intimate process. And it's, that's very interesting overall. So I want to ask why, why the titles, um, was hashtag shredded underneath like one of these pre people's posts or did, did you come up with that or? Um, so every title I took one of the actual hashtags from the image. Uh, so gratitude actually means, uh, gratefulness or gratitude. Um, so it's kind of similar to like hashtag blessed. Um, yeah, so I wanted to stay true to that. And it also is like additional data. Like you probably could never find these images again just with the data I've given you, but I kind of like hinting at it. And I wanted to once again reinforce the digital because I think that there's an intrinsic link between the language of textiles and the way digital imagery works, just the correlation between the pixel and then because you have all these finite points that form an image in almost a pointillistic way. And then weaving is heavily based on the binary system, uh, just like computers are, where you either have a thread showing on the surface or it's not showing on the surface. Uh, of course, there's ways around that, but that's kind of the basics of it. So I think that although we live in a society that kind of likes to force the integration of digital technology with traditional production, uh, I think that the development of textiles in the digital world was very um, sympathetic and natural uh, of a development. And I like the idea of taking these very ephemeral, I mean, textiles in general are thought of as more ephemeral than let's say, you know, stone carvings or ceramics. There aren't many examples from historical textiles because they degrade. But then if you look at something as ephemeral as a Instagram post, which is never gonna be printed, never made into, or very likely never made into a physical object, then fabric becomes very permanent in comparison. So I kind of like playing with that as well. I know that was way more of an explanation than just oh, the title. But. Fantastic. No, that's great. Um, and thinking about it now, especially when we're thinking about the world that we're in with the, the pandemic and not being able to go out and, and with, I guess the, this kind of coincides with future work. You know, our, is, this must be, I'm not sure if this is the current collection that you've been working with, but I can imagine gym photos have slowed down because people aren't allowed in gyms anymore, right? Have, are people still posting pictures of themselves? Is this like a continued sort of conversation that these bodybuilders are having over social media? Yeah, I Sorry, go ahead. 
Oh, you're on mute, Trey. Oh, I'm unmuted now. Um, I haven't checked in. Um, <laughs> I uh, personally am working on embroidery. What I found with this work is at a certain point, I found that the poses, there's only a certain number of poses that look very unique because I feel like these, there's certain poses that really show muscles. And I found more and more, it was more and more difficult to find poses that were really unique from one another. And I kind of took that as a sign of like, okay, let me shift into something else. Yeah, absolutely. Can I, can I throw in a comment? I've noticed, or someone's told me that um, it seems as though now on Instagram, these guys, they're posting, oh, I've lost so much mass, but they don't look any different at all. Um, and Trey, it's interesting what you're talking about, this whole feminization, because the other day I said to my husband, I said, when did guys start waxing their eyebrows? That um, was interesting. I've noticed some people on Instagram doing that. And to me, it just seems like a symbol of oppression to do all these things to oneself. So it's interesting how guys are taking up these symbols of oppression that have been placed on women for so long. Absolutely. Um, so I, I'm not sure if, if you brought it up with what you just said, Trey. Um, so what's the new project? Or are there any new projects that you've been working on or any new ideas you'd like to share? Yeah, um, I have a, a stack of embroideries right here that I'm working on. Um, I, I tend to work very, very controlled and precise and weaving. I wanted everything. You can see I put this grid background. I wanted everything perfect. And so I'm kind of trying to fight against that now. So I'm actually working on this series of embroideries. It's going to show up backwards for you. But um, that I'm not using a hoop. I'm using large uh, linen scrap thread. Um, and this series is actually about mostly me fighting with art and that as an overarching metaphor with going through a divorce at the same time. Um, so some of them kind of address different issues. And I'm being crazy, I'm not even keeping them unwrinkled, which is very counter to my nature. Normally I would be super obsessive with that. Um, Absolutely. Awesome. So kind of just really fusing these ideas. Um, and then these three laws of robotics, I used to call my ex a robot whenever I wanted to piss him off. Um, because that was just something that pissed him off because he didn't, because he was very, um, let's hope he never watches this. Uh, he is very analytical and very scheduled and everything had to be on a schedule. Um, so I guess in a way, this is kind of fighting back against that too, to have it be very, very messy. Absolutely. Keep it loose. Keep it loose. Um, um, Kira, so are, do, are you working on any new projects or, or where are you at in your creative process nowadays? Um, I mean, the quarantine has been quite, a, quite an ordeal. Um, but I'm back on the loom. I'm actually leaving more of the lesbian pride flag Lad, um, the idea of weaving, weaving a bunch of yardage, and I'm not really sure what form it'll take, but I have a preciousness about woven cloth, and I'm very hesitant to cut into it, so the idea is I will cut into this and really <laughs> explore form more. Um, I also, my partner and I have been um, revisiting some of my surface design work, and we've been making um, like one-of-a-kind masks um, using screen-printed cloth. Making one of a kind masks, you said. Mm -hmm. Very cool. And uh, so, what's the sort of one of a, one of a kind cloth? Is it mostly the plaid and the weavings that you work on, or? No, it's actually so. Before I got into weaving, I actually did a lot of representational drawing and did repeat patterns and then screen print them on cloth. So we found my treasure trove of samples and have been going through those and um, really having fun. We have like tentacle prints and we're piecing some and yeah. Wow and remind me again how long have you been doing weaving and working with with textiles? Um, so I've been working with textiles since I was a child um, and then I have a BFA in fiber and during that program I started weaving my junior year um, and so that was 
2015 was when I started weaving. Wow. And haven't stopped since, right? <laughs> oh, not at all. <laughs> so, so what about the process? Do you, do you enjoy so much? Is it the repetition and like, uh, you tell me. Um, there's something really physically satisfying for me about weaving. Um, like the physicality when I'm actually like at the loom and throwing a shuttle, it reminds me of like, I used to, I used to do swing dancing and it's kind of that same feeling, this repetitive motion, but it has a, a really like deep rhythm that I, makes me feel connected to my body in a really good way. Um, I also love the like, just, I am a, like a math brained person. So setting up all these, I love calculating stuff. I love setting up this like basically this analog computer um, to be able to do, to create these like really, um, un, like it's so magical how um, such a like a structured, like very planned thing can become something so, so fluid and, and soft and warm. Yeah, absolutely. The way you talk about, um, like it's so tactile and using your hands, it's like, you know, sculpture as well, you know, bringing something into fruition and like this sort of repetitive process. Yeah, it is very, it is very relaxing and calming. Um, and, and Bren, can, do you want to talk about a little bit about what you're doing and if you have anything coming up next, ideas? Oh, sure. Yeah. Um, Tracy, is it possible to um, stop sharing your screen and I'll share my screen then? Oh, great. Thanks. Let's see. One second. Can you all, can you all see that? Yes. Oh, yes. great. So I, a few years ago, I um, took a job where I worked all the time and I just, it just got me thinking, how did I end up here? And so I decided just to start a new large scale sampler, just reflecting on how I got here in my life. Plus I'm a, a little bit older. So um, beyond the title panel, there's a little family tree and to the right of the family tree are those flowers that are in the sampler also. And I think my husband, Doug, he's the model here in this photo. I think, let me see if I can, sorry about that. Let me try it this way. There we go. Here's a photo of the um, piece behind the photographer. And you'll see the third or fourth panel, there are some fighters um, in a similar vein to what Trey was working on. When I was in school, I was capturing these screenshots of these fighters, these cage fighters in these very homoerotic poses and I would uh, stitch line drawings of them. This, um, I decided not to really focus on the homoeroticism of it, but just to outline just two of the fighters getting ready to fight. Just hearkening back to that idea of uh, men being socialized to be violent in society. And on the right, let me see if I can, um, oh, I can. These are just, this is a labyrinth and these are um, things, training that we we're given how to survive horrible situations, part of my education. And let's see if I can get back to here. Whoops. One more. There. And so um, the, this, this is also part of that piece. So now on that big sampler, I'm adding onto it and I'm reflecting back to my childhood and as a kid, what I used to do. And on the left, that red um, sampler, Avoid Confrontations, this is a replication of my sampler number one, where when I refused to fight, I'm called a pussy. And then I decided, it got me thinking about during the COVID pandemic, how even wearing a mask can be deemed political or not being man enough by some people. But just this past week, it turns out that wearing a mask has been deemed patriotic. So that was surprising to me. So I updated the sampler on the right, the subsampler on the right. And if you look all the way to the left, you'll see in purple this NG. That is um, the logo of the King's department store that I used to go with, um, with my family to buy my lunchbox. And I think I have this, I found this the other day online. This is the actual lunchbox that I got for first grade. And so I'll stop sharing now. Wow. Thanks for sharing. Yes. Um, great. Well, any other, uh, any, anything else any of the artists want to talk about with um, future work, 
things that they've been, things where they're going. If not, we can go uh, into the question portion. I know we have a couple of questions in the chat room, but any questions to start out with for all of you? Any statements? <laughs> I'm going to go ahead and ask some questions from the chat room and um, let's see. Uh, one question, and actually if, I, if the person's got their name on there, I'm going to give them a shout out. This is from Rebecca Levi, who's also um, one of the artists in the show, and she'll be, I think, joining us at the next conversation. She says, Bren, I've always been fascinated by the scale of your work. How did you come to make the choice to work at a large scale? in a medium that's expressed smaller and often smaller? Oh, um, when I was in school, they always tell you to do more, make more. You've made a hundred of these things and they say, oh, that's good, make 200 more. Oh, yeah, I just got right. kind of tired of it. Totally and so also, is someone there? I thought I heard some noise, I'm sorry. Um, and um, so I just said, I said, I'm just gonna scale this up. Also, I um, tend to have arthritis or some sort of repetitive stress thing, so it's easier for me, for me to make bigger stitches. So I made this big, big sampler the same size, and I wrote the word more on it in these huge letters. And then under it, I put a little rooster because it's kind of a, um, you know, a symbol of masculinity, a rooster. And I showed it to my critique class, and one of my classmates said, oh my god, do you realize that you just, you just um, wrote more cock on your piece? I never thought about that, so um, I don't really show that piece that much. So that's how I got there. Uh, I think it's just a reaction to being told to do more in school and also just physical constraints. Okay, we have another question for Kira, and that is, uh, and it's from Greg Wilkins, who's also one of the artists in the show, and he'll be, I hope, joining us at the next session. Um, Kira, have you thought about creating a plaid tartan that, uh, I'm sorry, a pride plaid tartan um, that could be selected to make a kilt? You thought that, of somebody wearing your... That is actually something I've looked into, especially because I found um, a couple of gay kilt makers in, I think, Cleveland, who I was potentially going to contact. There is actually an officially, like, registered pride tartan now. Um, I don't like it. <laughs> I think I could make a better one. <laughs> yeah. I have a piggyback question to that. So if you don't like the pre-existing tartan, how do you go about negotiating to get your tartan in there? Um, I'm not uh, you can like design new tartans and you put them up in an official registry and that's like they'll if you need to find out word borders for specific things they'll like send you the information um there's like a specific registry in scotland of tartan patterns now um but i don't know if they would have two in the official registry but i also don't need it to be in the official registry i take it It is interesting to think about how one gets the authority to submit a plaid to represent such a large population. Although I, I know the Cleveland uh, Kilted Bros, I think is, Kilted Brothers is the company in, in Cleveland and they made an official Cleveland tartan as well. Okay, we have another question for Trey. It's from Rebecca, hello, she says, you said something about fighting with your work in your most recent series. Does that mean fighting with the work itself? And can you expand on that if so? Um, I think the fighting, it, it emerged. So I had a very transitional time in my life. I graduated from grad school. Um, decided to divorce my husband and my dog died all within like six months. Um, so yeah, and so I think that really magnified the postgraduate school, like what do I do now? 
And part of that, I feel like there was a certain amount of frustration that throughout school I had kind of told yeah, myself, like, oh, it'll, it'll like, work, work out. Right. Once I graduate, I everything will <laughs> fall into place. Um, and all those sort of like, things that you kind of say to get yourself through. And then once I graduated, I was like, oh, crap, what now? Um, so I had, I had some sort of like resentment almost in me towards the art as if it, it should have like carried me somewhere or that there should have been this like pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. Um, which more and more like I'm realizing that like it's about the journey, of course, um, and not about these goals that I think our education system kind of puts in our heads since we're like first go to school, it's like, oh, just make it to middle school, then you can make it to high school, then you can make it through college, then you can make it through grad school. And then at a certain point, it's like, oh, what have I been waiting for? I should have uh, been enjoying this the whole time. So I think that's what the fight is, is that it was kind of some of the same feelings that I was feeling towards my relationship with my ex-husband seemed to kind of relate to some of the feelings I was uh, feeling towards art in kind of a capital A sense and the art world. Um, but it's kind of evolved to be more of, um, it started with that kind of bitterness, but now it's become more of a humorous look, which is kind of a tendency I have as a coping mechanism to begin with is to take a humorous look at things. And so I think that's going to be the direction that the work evolves into. Um, I'm kind of just letting this pile build up and then I think I'm going to go back and make an executive artistic decision, um, which ones to just get rid of and which ones make sense together. Are there any questions that are generated um, between the artists before I continue on with a few things still coming in on the chat room? Anything you guys want to expand on? One thing I just wanted to mention that um, Bryn was talking about his boxers. Another thing I forgot to mention about my work and it kind of connects the two is uh, I've always really adored the work of Barbara Kruger. Um, and then there's this one specific piece, uh, untitled, but you construct intri intricate rituals which allow you to touch the skin of other men. And it's just this image of these men roughhousing. Um, and that was kind of an inspiration for my work. And I think it kind of applies to that same kind of homoerotic idea of boxers that I thought was really interesting. Yeah, and it's kind of sad how intimacy has to be expressed rather than just the physical touching between two men has to be expressed through fighting rather than a hug or some other means. So it kind of makes me sad. Is it, well, that's how it was when I was growing up. Is it still like that between men? I, I mean, I get that general sense. I mean, I think there's exceptions. I think things are starting to change but at the same time I grew up in the deep south I'm from Louisiana so a lot of these masculine stereotypes I felt were especially magnified um, in my upbringing so I don't know if I have the most accurate read on it either. I have an interesting question that's come in that I think um, I'm going to address it to Bren but I think it's something that uh, all of you can talk about, given the nature of textile work being such a labor intensive, um, uh, well, for most people, a labor, many of us, a labor intensive process. How do you navigate pain and expressing yourself through manual labor? Oh, I can't get my list. Um, Kara, do you want to go first? 
<laughs> sure. <laughs> um, so for me, and I know this, this was something I was actively discouraged of expressing um, during my schooling was that my art and the practices I use are a kind of therapy for me. Um, I struggle with mental health issues and I feel like I need to be connected to my body and present in the moment and weaving and embroidery really do that for me in a way that I think other mediums aren't I just I don't feel a connection with as much. Um, I also think that these processes like because they're so time intensive you end up reflect you can reflect so much on the feelings and like all the content that goes into the work. So I feel like, like it's imbued in the in the work as you go. How about you, Trey? Um, well, it's interesting because now throughout my work, I've done everything from the very, very hand manipulated. I think the most intensive as far as physical potential pain for me was doing um, crocheted fillet lace um, with extremely tiny thread. Uh, that was the one thing that I was like, okay, I need to really pay attention and start focusing on my body. So I got like compression gloves and everything and I made sure I stretched a lot, which sounds really intense, but I, it kind of was um, just doing all that intricate work. All the way to the knit pieces are a completely uh, digital industrially controlled machine. I thread the yarn through a feeder and then I press the button and I walk away and hope nothing goes wrong. Uh, so it's kind of like a printer. Um, but I kind of have an obsession with making things more complicated. Uh, so even my woven pieces, one of the reasons I did them on a hand loom, even though it's digital, is because all the special sparkly yarns and fuzzy yarns and pattern inlay is all to an extent manually manipulated. So I kind of can't help myself. So I don't know what's gonna happen when I get to the point that my body starts to get really mad at me because my brain is not gonna want to give up on that. I, I wonder if that trait of making things more complicated is particular to textile artists because I notice I do that too. Some of my samplers, when I do them, I say, oh, I hate this, it's just taking forever. And then once I finish, I'm like, oh, that's kind of cool. That's kind of interesting. Um, for me, about navigating pain, the physical pain, I, I take breaks. I don't embroider as long as I used to when I was younger. Um, but this question also got me thinking about emotional pain. <clears throat> and I've done also the series of death samplers in which I document a parallel universe and I die. Um, these death samplers got me I was inspired to do them through these, do you ever read these horrible news articles online? Like someone did something, maybe not so wise, but then they were killed or something like that. Then you read the comments and people say, oh, Darwin Award, duh, they should have known. And that got me thinking about times in my own life when I may not have exhibited the wisest judgment, but I was just lucky and I survived. So in these samplers, I'm documenting a parallel history in which I wasn't lucky. For example, one time in college, I climbed around this, roof of this high Victorian um, apartment, apartment house to um, have a tryst with a secret lover. And I got back to my place and thought, that was stupid, I could have fallen off to my death on the third floor. Um, and so I documented that, um, I've documented a parallel history in which I actually died. And so I've done a couple of these and it got me thinking just about this, um, the pain, a, re a reviewer wrote about my work, actually one of those pieces, later that you can tell that he grew up during the time of AIDS, when AIDS first came to be, because all his work is about death. And I've also done this series of active shooter um, pieces. And so it's, um, so I guess I'm trying to process some sort of pain through my work too. And plus the fact that the words text and textile come from the same root meaning to weave um, amplifies the storytell storytelling function of textiles. So I guess I'm trying to tell stories. Um, we have another question that's off in a different direction, but I think a good one. Have any of you artists taken your work and made it commercial 
And has there been any advantage to not going in that direction with your work? Uh, maybe even a discussion. I'm thinking about the difference, but you know, can personal be commercial? How do you cross that line? Do you think about your work on a commercial commercial level at all? Uh, I think I can speak to that a little bit. Um, I've done some. So after I graduated, I actually worked for a fabric print company for a year that sold prints to uh, hobby stores. And it was definitely an eye opener uh, to see the commercial side of things. Um, I don't think I would personally want my work fully in that full commercial capitalistic environment because there's so many things that contribute to what gets produced that is far beyond uh, your artistic control. Um, I don't know how many fabrics we produced that were so ugly, um, usually involving puppy dog paws and tie dye and various fusions thereof. Um, and it came down to just like a capitalistic, this is what sells, let's make another one like this. Um, I've also done work that's just like, I'll do a batch of scarves every once in a while and sell them. But I, I tend to keep my kind of commercial work like that, kind of a separate identity than my other work. Uh, mostly because I don't want to think about the consumer as much as I want to think about the audience with my artwork. It's more important to me for people to see my work than necessarily to make sure that somebody eventually owns it, if that makes any sense. That's interesting you mentioned about keeping your commercial work separate, because when I was in school we had this scarf sale to raise money for the department. And I remember the scarf was kind of cool, but I did not want my name put on it they put the name on the tag of the artist and I just didn't want it for that reason, um, that I didn't want my name associated with that. For me, in terms of commercial, I've, haven't, I, behind me, you can see there's a panel of that um, fabric with those footballs and baseballs. Um, I haven't tried to sell that. I've had it put on a chair, but I haven't tried to sell that. I've worked with a gallery before and they, I really learned a lot from the gallery. I really loved working with them. One thing I didn't like working with the gallery was that my fighters, uh, they thought they had commercial possibilities, so they wanted me to make more fighters. And I didn't want to do that because I was kind of over it. And so I was just resenting it as I was making them. So that's my experience. Um, I feel like I have a somewhat different relationship to like the idea of commercialization just in that um, after I went through art school um, and got my BFA, I did a program in Western Massachusetts where I did an intensive to learn traditional Swedish weaving. And it in some ways helped set up you to potentially become a production weaver. Um, so less maybe large scale manufacturing, more like a cottage industry. But that is something I do dip my toes into occasionally. I have found a real joy in making um, functional objects which is something I didn't think I would do. And I think that's kind of a specific thing for fiber art where it's like you, there's more, there's more because it's already devalued, there's maybe more of an emphasis of a separation. Whereas I know ceramicist friends who can make mugs and no one bats an eyelash. Um, but that's just something I'm, I occasionally like make placemats and towels and it's a way to explore color and pattern. I don't really think of it as my fine art work, but I do think of it as part of my practice. Yeah, there's something really nice about just sitting down and weaving a scarf, especially after you've like racked your brain for hours and hours about the theory and the meaning and the metaphor of an art piece, just to be like, I really like the way this plaid looks or the way that this uh, twill is, or let me do a pattern that is like super weaving 101 and just 
enjoy it developing on the loom. Um, I think that's why, like when I weave a scarf, it's so different than my artwork is because it's kind of an outlet. When I do something functional, I'm just like, let me just weave. Yeah, sometimes it feels good to just make and not necessarily think behind the making, right? I mean, we are artists, everyone's artists, so they like working with their hands ultimately at the end of the day. Um, one of my professors, I'm sorry, one of my professors in school talked about that whole idea of making. He just said we spend so much time on computers that we're kind of disconnected from the material, so he just said it's really nice to make. I agree. Mm -hmm. Agreed. Um, Jesse, do you think we have time for uh, another question or? Well, we do. We have one more question and I think okay. it's a fairly easy one. And it really, Bren and Kira, um, did you make the artwork behind you? And um, Bren, can you share the artwork behind you? Because we've seen this graphic, but I don't know that we can actually read it. So. Kira, do you want to go first? Sure. Um, so this is actually a color gamp, which in weaving, it's like just a, it's a basically a way to test your colors. Um, so this is like all the A2 cotton for a specific brand. And you just, it's plain weave, it's even stripes. So you can see all the mixes. So it actually did it as this like, um, you know, like color exercise, but it looks fantastic. It looks like, <laughs> you know, a pride flag. It looks like um, a color picker on a computer program. I, I love it. Oh, and me, um, about the work behind me. Oh, behind me are, immediately behind me are two samplers. I'm trying to see which way to, to bend. Um, this first one, I, when I was working, I had this ambivalent attitude towards work because I was, just thought I was born into the wrong socioeconomic class. Um, but I had to work. So I just decided to document how I wasted time throughout the different decades. Can you see that? And um, so, and if you notice in every decade, you, let me, I don't know if I need to get closer. Is that better? Is that crazy? And you'll notice in each decade that um, gossiping appears in each decade. And then to the right of it is one of my death samplers where I'm actually found um, dismembered in a park in Philadelphia. And each of them, each of the death samplers has a little limerick on it. I won't, you can go to my website to check it out. And then there's a map of uh, Center City, Philadelphia on top of it. And behind me is the, um, the fabric with the flowers on it. Sorry for my shaking. Okay, I think that we're gonna wrap it up with that. Do you, um, Ray, any final questions or comments from you or any of the artists? And, and I'll just, before I mute myself for a last time, thank you all so much for coming. And I think we have links to your personal websites up on our website in the Pride Show. And I think also in the links to this particular Zoom meeting. So um, please, we want to encourage folks in the audience to take a closer look at the um, really amazing work of these artists. And thank you so much for contributing to the Textile Center family um, this summer in kicking off the Pride exhibition for us. Um, we appreciate you. And we look forward to seeing you guys as audience participants um, when, you're, when your comrades uh, do Pride 2 in August. So I'll let you wrap it up. Perfect, yes, thank you, Tracy. That pretty much sums it up. Thank you again for joining today. I loved seeing your work and you know, helping Tracy put it up and everything. I mean, I got really up close and personal. It's just beautiful. It's just wonderful. So thanks again. Um, cl to clarify, it is not August 20th, but it's uh, Thursday, August 13th. So coming up quick within the next two weeks for the next Pride discussion. Hope you can make it. Um, and again, thanks. Thanks for everything.